I want to call to order the work session on the John Thomas building. We will begin by uh, looking around making introductions to those involved in the presentation and assembly members present, starting on Mr. Michaelis. Uh, George Michaelis, municipal manager. Alex Kowski, maintenance and operations. Allison, real estate department. Uh, Paul Honeman on the phone, assembly, Ernie Hall. Jennifer Johnston. Debbie O.C. Andrew. Big Bridge. L.B. Bridges. And we have Ms. Drummond also in transit, and uh, and the say Mr. Hornman will join us shortly. Uh, with that, Mr. Michaelis, we'll yes. let you begin. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I think we're here because uh, the administration uh, has uh, submitted to the assembly the proposal uh, to sell uh, the John Thomas building. Um, and we're here, we've got enough folks here, we can answer probably whatever questions you may have. But just to, to give you a real quick overview, uh, as you know, the John Thomas building has been owned by the city for a number of years, and it uh, was basically retrofitted and, and uh, renewed, so to speak, uh, quite a few years ago using a HUD grant. And with that HUD grant, there were certain requirements that was placed on the city and also placed on how that building would be used. Uh, However, it also did say that at such time, uh, if it was disposed of, that the money that was used by HUD, and there's a percentage that we have to go by, uh, basically uh, has to be taken out of the proceeds and goes back into the uh, CDBG grant funds for further redistribution on new projects or whatever. Uh, we have been approached uh, several times, uh, actually numerous times, about selling this particular facility. Uh, and not only just in this administration, but even previously. And uh, uh, when you look at the facility, its age, you look at the amount of maintenance that we currently put in each year, plus the deferred maintenance that we have out there on this facility, and there are major systems in the facility itself that at some point in time are going to have to be uh, replaced, uh, major components. And that's going to be very costly. So the rent income that we receive does not even come close to uh, taking care of the just the yearly uh, maintenance cost that we have on that facility, uh, let alone uh, trying to go ahead and go in and uh, basically put in or replace major component systems in the facility. So as a result of that, uh, as also as a result of uh, getting uh, what we think is the, 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 uh, the appraised value of that facility. Uh, in looking at it long term, probably the best thing to do is to sell the facility, and that's why the recommendation is coming before the assembly to do that. The handout that was provided to you, and I think each and every one of you have it, is pretty darn detailed and, and pretty go it pretty much goes into the, the whole gamut. It also tells you what our maintenance costs uh, are, have been. It also shows you the nonprofit organizations that uh, currently reside there and um, most of them for quite a long period of time. Uh, it tells you the square footage that we have there, and it also tells you what uh, the minimum offering uh, would be for this particular facility. Uh, so with that, I would open it up to any questions that anyone has. Mm -hmm. Yes, help. Just uh, straight jacks. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Training, you got to stand up first, so I'll be able to Just a question, Thank George. You. Appreciate that. If we don't agree to sell it, what's the what's the administration's fallback? Well, because it could happen, and no other bosses, we don't sell it. So what are you guys going to do? I, I have learned that anything can happen. You know, yes. on Tuesday nights. <laughs> uh, the answer to that question is, uh, I mean, if we can't sell it, uh, you know, currently it's it's leased out. We probably have to figure out a way to at least come closer, or hopefully completely recover uh, what at least the maintenance costs are in it. How to recover enough money to be able to replace major component systems uh, as they go bad, that's a different story. Uh, we have to really think hard about that. Now the leases that we have, are they long-term leases or are they year-to-year -year leases? They're year. year, -year. Thank you. Mr. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so George, and I'm trying to read this. You know, we just got it just now. But anyway, maybe it's in here. But how did the city acquire the building in the first place? I, I'm not sure how we actually acquired it way back when. You know, Alex? Well, I know the land was acquired from the state in 1969. 
and I don't have any records that show if there was actually building on it at that time. Um, I know we have um, evidence of it in the early 70s. So the city bought the land from the state? We, we got it in our municipal entitlement. Okay. Great. And, and then, um, <clears throat> so Mr. Kayes, I heard you say that when it's sold, the, the grant money goes back into the CBTG pot yes, for right. redistribution. So, 79%. Right, so reserve. it goes back into the pot and doesn't have to go back to the federal government? No, it goes back into the pot for further use here in Anchorage. Okay, and so I heard that the building was in you know, not in really good shape and, and this memo is saying it's in poor condition. So you really think you're going to get one point? Six million dollars for a building that's in poor condition, regardless of the fact that it's in downtown. Really, think you're going to do that much? Uh, we, well, I, I, I know the answer to the question. I have to be careful how I. I don't want to spoil our chances of well, selling it. Here. You can keep twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the appraisal that we have that gave us that price is twenty million dollars. Specifically, takes into consideration the condition of the building and how much land there is, whether it's code for parking, and uh, other um, expenses, and um, revenue potential. So what was the appraisal? It's a one million six hundred fifty. So that is appraisal. Okay, and what, appraisal. okay, and what is the city's assessed value? What's the assessed value on the city's records? Well, because it's owned by us, we haven't actually had an assessor's value put on it. I did ask for a a, uh, we had to do a comparison between what the building was worth when we put the CDBG funds into it and what it's worth now. So the um, Martin and East group came up with uh, um, kind of a comparable value based on other values in that neighborhood. And I believe it was just $100,000 100, below this value. So when the appraiser looked at it versus the way the city looked at it, it was not significantly different. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just add to that also, uh, it, um, it was kind of unique. Uh, we had to work with uh, HUD to figure out how we would ascertain what the right way to go forward in selling this that would be acceptable to them um, as far as not only the percentage that they would take, but how we would actually appraise this particular building. And it took us months to negotiate that with HUD, and so they agreed with our approach at this particular time. Mr. Train, have we asked the state for any dollars to bring the building back up to standards? Has it been on a capital projects list ever? Uh, it, it, it has not been during this administration. Whether it was in the past administrations, I don't know. Do you know how much money we'd have to get from the state to make it so it's the maintenance problems are taken care of, George? <laughs> There's several things that are that are considered, you know, towards the end of their lifespan in the building. The elevators, one, the uh, the boiler system, the, the roof has about 10 years left based on the evaluation we had in 09. We did an engineer study. So when you get into those major systems, um, and then the painting, a lot of it is, uh, you know, it's a lead-based paint, so it has to be uh, treated as hazardous uh, because of when the building was built and stuff. So we're probably looking at to the tune of a million dollars, somewhere in that eight hundred to a million dollars. The elevator loan could be in the three to five hundred thousand range to replace the elevator. So the total would be what a million and a half? I'm guessing I'm, I'm somewhere in that range, around a million. I think you could do most of the major components. The, based on the size of the building. Thank you. These carpet, I mean, you know, the, the building's in poor shape. I know, but when I look at who uses that building, the vast majority of people use it, I worry about losing a building that provides that much service to our city. I, have, I haven't done an in-depth analysis of cost, but I just, you know, off the cuff, I would say it's in that range of main to, uh, you know, main to. Thank you. Mr. Ray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thought Steve, I thought I heard you say that the elevator needs to be replaced. Not right now, but it will be shortly. Well, yeah. wasn't it replaced a couple of years ago? No. Really? Uh, it was just fixed. A, we made was, some major repairs. We made to some it. major changes to it because of the uh, that that elevator has a, a single shaft, so uh, you know 
anytime if we're going to go in there, we have to bring it up to a new standard. So that's very expensive. So a few years ago, there were just some repairs or not a replacement. Okay, I thought it was a replacement. Um, what's the timeline? Pardon? What's the timeline? I read the ordinance, but what's, what is the timeline on the, um, the sale of this building? We, we, we feel that it could be sold by the end of the year. And in terms of, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, the the um, rent, the tenants, what's the timeline for when they have to find some place else? What it, what it says there. Well, there's no intention on our part to evict any of the tenants. They would go. I mean, their leases would be part of what the new owner takes on. Some of the leases are one year at this point in time. And I believe there's one right now that's month to month because they haven't completed the one year lease. That was approved. So in other words, when when you sell a building, it'll be quote uh, a package deal, like the tenants will stay, and then if the new owners decide to raise the rent, that's going to be between them and the tenants. So so let me see if I can answer that correctly. Jump in if I'm incorrect, but I think I know the right answer here. So assuming that it's an annual lease and assuming that uh, the leases end on the 31st of December, assume that we sell the building for assumption purposes only in November, those folks are protected to the end of the year. Of this year? This year. Okay. And then it's up to the new owner as to whether or not they want to go ahead and continue the lease with the current parties or if they want to do something different. Right, so my next question is this. Assuming that you sell the building at the end of the year, you don't close until April, but the tenants have a new lease in place that doesn't end until the end of 13, they're protected. Yes, that's correct. The they, new owner would have to honor the, the current lease. Right, so it could very well be another that's, year. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Johnston. I'm not quite sure if I should ask this or not because if we do sell it, but you brought up lead paint, and when I hear lead paint, I sometimes think asbestos. Also, just sort of it's all in the same timeline. We haven't done uh, an environmental study, I don't believe, on, on the whole facility, but that would be things that would be taken into consideration. And then the other part, because it's a municipal building and. And I'm always amazed what the governments can do versus what the private sector can do. How is the building as far as building code? I mean, well, it goes based on when it was built. So. Yeah, it, it, right now it meets, it meets code. Uh, if we go in there and make any major improvements or renovations, depending on the percentage of the type of improvements we make, then we may have to bring it completely up to the new so The elevator is one of those examples. Well, I would think with the elevator, that's. I mean, that's what kind of perk. Once you take just a small, my understanding is, if you went for a permit for the elevator, then that just kind of cascades throughout the whole building, as far as electrical and. So I would, I would, I would look at it a little bit differently. So if we go in and have to repair the heating system in there, now what we're dealing with is not only the major mechanical system as far as your HVAC system. electrical. Now you're talking about electrical. That's so now thinking. you're going into the walls and you're going to have to replace electrical. And because of the percentage and the dollar amount and everything else, it probably will kick in that we have to upgrade everything else. And, and, and is that then, correct? And is then, then we might have... And in this building, a lot of the piping in this building is a galvanized piping. And it, it, we're running into all our major uh, municipal facilities that, that are 30 to 35 years old. They're just rotting from the inside out, the pipe. So um, that's another issue we have in that that building so um, like George said once we get into systems uh, there is a point in time where yeah. the, the building is going to the, the permit folks are going to say okay you got to bring everything up to code once you get to a certain value per percentage so a million could be on the low end it, it could be I haven't I haven't sat and gone through the systems and yeah. the square footage but I, I just know that the major components you're looking at in excess of a million I think but that doesn't include, I don't think, code upgrade. That's just oh, no, replacement. That's, that's just yeah, replacement of the four or five things I mentioned. And could be, could be very low. It could be. Mr. Training. Have you guys checked for asbestos in this building? We have a problem with asbestos in our public health I can building. get back with you. I, I don't believe we've done an in-depth study of this building. 
I would be interested in that because that might mitigate as much money as they want to offer for the building if we sell it because they've got to clean it up asbestos. Uh, nor normally asbestos, you don't have to clean it unless it's disturbed. I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, it's only when you I know, I worked rebuild. for the federal government. They just came in and put paint on it and said, now it's sealed. I've been there before. I just want to know if there's asbestos in that building or not. Thank you. Thank you. I will find out and get back with Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, two things. With um, all the costs that you are stating that um, is going to be, the money that's going to be needed to fix the building, you still think you're going to get $1.6 million for it? I mean, you got a million dollars. I mean, I mean that's, that's for them, but. Well, I don't. Yeah. In answer to your question, I believe so, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Ms. Oceander. Has there been any discussion with the tenants about increasing rates to help pay? Well, we just increased them last year. <coughs> I know. I know. I'm, I'm assuming that it's unrealistic, but I just wondered if that discussion had ever occurred. Uh, not recently, I don't believe, as in Allison. I'm not over what we're at right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 12 did have an increase. It seems from the figures as if it would have to be pretty significant if to offset entirely. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I'm uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Honeman. Yeah, I'm just down the street, so I should be in just a minute, but just in case. Um, and I didn't hear everything, but uh, I, I guess I need to know, perhaps even through our own review or legal, would there be any preclusion from the sale of this building to either a nonprofit or conglomeration of nonprofit? Uh, with the condition, you know, for, for a very small fee, but with a condition that if they ever decide to unoccupy the building or turn it for sale, that the city would go back to reverting to city ownership for the purpose of sale. For instance, uh, the Mountain View substation at one time was a residence in Mountain View, and it was a HUD purchase for $1. It was literally a purchase from HUD for a dollar, and, and it became a police substation. Now, I understand that actual property currently is up for sale, but is there any preclusion under either our code or from HUD to, in, I guess, for lack of better terms, engage in a transaction that where the city therefore is off the hook for maintenance expenses and such, but that require that the tenants maintain and, and I guess, operate within the conditional use of the building? Okay, uh, so I'll answer a portion of that question and then Allison will jump in with the rest of it if I don't answer it correctly. So, uh, in answer to your question, could we sell it to a nonprofit? Absolutely. Could a nonprofit take it over and use it for other nonprofits? Absolutely. In fact, there was one tenant, current, I believe it's a current tenant, that did approach us uh, some time ago about the possibility of buying the facility and using it for uh, the existing nonprofits. We also had another nonprofit outside of the existing uh, facility that approached us about buying it uh, as well, and they would use it for nonprofits. Uh, so the bottom line is uh, there is no preclusion, there is no exclusion uh, that would prevent that from happening. That could happen. Uh, there's also other entities that uh, are not nonprofits uh, that are for profits that have some interest in the facility as well. Did you get that, Paul? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. We'll see you shortly. I was walking in the door. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Training? I mean, just so we don't, don't normally let uh, people testify, but I would like to hear from some of these organizations that are listed in this document. I see how we impact them. We'll get to that. I want to make sure we got time. Yes. yes. I, I've been waiting for one of you to make that point. Uh, Real quickly, a, a couple of questions that I've got is, do we have any health and safety issues in that building at the current time? And going right along with that, what is our liability if we have a major component failure in there? You, you give an indication that the mechanical system is aging, the elevator um, is going out uh, or is at risk. So what is our liability if, if we had a, a major failure at one of those components? Um, 
what what do we what's our liability in regards to? So let, let me ask, uh, answer part of that. Alan will answer the uh, the maintenance piece of it. First of all, uh, I think you know us better than most. We would not be letting anybody live in there if it was unsafe. So the facility currently is safe. Uh, we've spent uh, the money necessary to keep it safe. Uh, the question is what happens in the down years? Obviously, if we have a major failure in the system, whatever that system is, uh, the owners would be on us to be able to fix it somehow. And so we'd have to fix it. Uh, we have, would have that obligation. If at any point in time it looked to us like there was an unsafe condition, uh, eminent or on the horizon, then the onus would be on us to make sure that we fixed it so that we didn't put anybody's life or limb uh, in danger. Bottom line. Is that going to be your answer? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, um, you know, we we have just looked at these documents. So, uh, but on the, uh, on the spreadsheet that we've got here in regards to um, revenue and expense, in, in revenue here, I keep reading uh, 10500 per year, yet on uh, the back page here, I see an annual rent of 35604 There was a large change in rents in 012. So this is okay. historical, and on this page here is the action right. today. Okay, so it would appear, well, you picked up a couple of tenants, but it would appear what rents doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Went to 25 cents a square foot, it and there were went below to 25 cents. And in these past years, what has it been? Uh, uh, seven. It was, I think it was seven, seven cents, cents a square, square foot. foot. Seven. 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 Okay. Thank you. That was a good question. Uh, and we're at 25 cents here. Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm going to have to leave. Uh, oh, if you have any specific questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them before I leave. Anyone, any questions for Mr. Michaelis prior to the empty party? Mr. Trainy? Mr. Michaelis, I'd just like to know if you could print out exactly what you guys do, intend to do, if in fact if someone turns this down for next meeting. Because I just want to know what will be the next step you guys will take. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Sosian? No, just, I, I think I understood that correctly. So this chart actually should read on the bottom figure 35,000, not 10. Yeah, that, that would be for 2012. If we put a 2012 column in there, yeah. Okay, I need that a 2012 cost, too. This information came out of our maintenance, uh, the people that handled the revenue and the maintenance. This, and she only had uh, full years. She, the way that the system is, she can only go full years. Okay, do you know if the total cost of escalated dramatically or no, roughly? We, we see a trend that they're staying fairly, fairly I mean, it's roughly 75, 78,000, so I wouldn't see a big okay. change. A lot of it's snow removal, so, stuff like that, so it varies based on the weather. Okay, stuff. never mind, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. McCurris. Appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Coleman, Ms. Drummond, uh, any other questions prior to. Uh, Opening this up for individuals that are in attendance to comment. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, what we are going to do is I will recognize you individually that, that wish to speak. What I do ask of you is please try to be as brief as you can. Let's pretend we're in an assembly meeting. I want to try to hold you to about three minutes each. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Len Kelly, and I'm with the old president of the Older Persons Action Group. We've been in the building for over 30 years. If you read the 1993 ordinance, which you may or may not have, under Tom Fink, uh, the assembly found a public use uh, for low-income and disabled people, and that's why the CDBG money was granted to us, the Older Persons Action Group, to make the changes in that building and bring it up to code. Now, if the, if the administration, I understand the administration's problem. The administration's problem is, is for 20 years, They've done no, no work on that building at all, and a lot of the nonprofits be in there for seven cents. We knew that. But what, what person in the right mind or what organization in the right mind is going to ask for an increase in the rent? But the long and the short of it, if the gentleman, the manager, is correct with regard to all the stuff that has to be done, which we do not believe has to be done, the hazardous waste thing, the code thing, and everything else, none of this has been disclosed in the appraisal, so please read the appraisal. Uh, but what I wanted to hit 
and I'll try to be very succinct on it, is basically the basic premise is, is that these nonprofits, including us, had no value uh, to, the, to the government. Uh, that's just not accurate. It is true that we're subsidized, but it's, it's a benefit uh, to the municipality based upon the real cost of, and the things that we do uh, for the municipality with regard to low-income people and disabled people. But uh, the, the thing is, is, even though the manager did say it be sold, could be sold to a nonprofit, if you read the ordinance, it says private. Nonprofits are not private. So it'd be, not, it'd be nice if we could do something like this, is engage the municipality of Anchorage because we need a home. Uh, and it's true uh, uh, that the place does need some work, but it's basically uh, an old Class C building, uh, low rents. We're willing to pay the low rents. We're willing to upgrade it. We're even willing to go to the municipality of Anchorage that has gets additional CDBG money and ask them to help us upgrade the building with CDBG money or go to the state. But uh, there's really been uh, no real effort to deal with the nonprofits. Now, assuming 79% assuming of the sale money is going to go back to the municipality of Anchorage and go into their general CDBG grant money, uh, why can't that money be used as the bid-in money for the nonprofits to buy the building? Uh, and then maybe a dollar for the difference 21. Uh, uh, there, there are lots of things that can be done here. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but based upon that, you want me to be quick. The main thing is, is I've been short of finding documents. It took me a long time to find the old ordinance, get the old ordinance. I've requested of the municipality to give me the HUD docu documents with the restrictions as well as uh, 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 the contacts with the HUD people. So we could talk to them and find out what's going on and what we can do to protect these nonprofits. Now, it is true that the municipality has raised our rent. Uh, no problem with that. Uh, we're, we are all paying that increased rent. It's a little challenge now, but we're doing it. But there's additional space that can be rented out, and nothing's been done there with regard to that additional space. Uh, so we're, we continue to be and will always be willing partners with the municipality of Anchorage uh, uh, with regard to this building or any other building uh, uh, that benefits the types of fo folks that we uh, deal with. Ms. Johnson. Um, I have a question of the administration. You brought up the point as far as CDBG monies. Is that something that we could do with the HUD grant? Could we um, apply it to this building for the nonprofits? Do you know if that's possible? Yeah, we pass that over to huh? the HUD folks. Yeah. The, some of the activities may be eligible for the CDBG funds. Oh, the second some of the activities may be eligible but CDBG funds cannot be used for maintenance and so something that CDBG funds were used before to fix probably wouldn't be able to use those again but if there's other things in the building that need to be done that we didn't put the money in most likely it would qualify long as you could document that the people in the building are serving the people that are low to moderate income and then you would have to meet the other requirements of reporting to document that they're doing that and then just a follow up on that. What if that 79% was applied to the purchase price? Would that be possible? In other words, you know, if I guess, and I understand you'd have to have the right tenants to qualify for this building to be CDBG funded, but would that work? I'm not sure I follow your question. What I'm saying is if this building went for sale, right? And and 79% of the sale price goes back into our CDBG funds. Would the purchaser, being nonprofits, be able to apply that 79% into the purchase price of the building? Uh, with, with the grants, I mean, I, I, Well, of the CDBG funds, the community has the option of granting however much of that pot to whoever they want to for any eligible activity. So it, it's it another could, acquisition. It, um, it could be done if, if, it all, the, done if all the lords were... Or if, and, you, know, you could look at it a different way. It wouldn't necessarily line. have to be sold. Right. If you're wanting to give it to a nonprofit, you know, there's ways 
if you want them to do that. Yeah. I guess I, that, that was brought up as one of the, so I just wanted to see. I, I just wanted to put that in there. Just, just a moment. I, oh, sorry. It, it's really tough being a chair, keeping everything in sequence, but Mr. Traney had uh, asked for the forum. So when the sorry, administration come and talk to you guys about their plans to sell the building? Or I've come talk to you about would you like to buy it or what? Interesting, that before the election, it kind of died away. And uh, now it's come back up again. And uh, the real estate folks, one folks did come to our building and meet, meet with everybody. But we ended up talking about giving parking spaces to the soup kitchen. <laughs> Nothing about what the issue with, that they say that they told us about is, is basically how can we deal with the municipality of Anchorage to protect our in, our collective interest. And then it is true that uh, recently they dropped off a copy of the public notice, which is your car windows or what? No, no, they were they brought it upstairs to our executive director, uh, which was nice. Uh, but this is we've had a, a dearth of conversation with the municipality of Anchorage with regard to how to protect our interest as a nonprofit. So I take by your answer that the mayor's not come to see you, neither is the city manager? Well, he sent us uh, nice letters and things telling us we're doing good jobs. But so the answer is no. Thank you. No. Okay. All right. Now, sir, you were, you were next, and then I got a nice young lady in the back that's in the queue. So I, I just wanted to say that when you read the old ordinance, and please read it, it shows where that CDBG money went, to what recipients. We're one of the few organizations that applied for that money and received that money. That uh, and we're in existence today. We serve the exact same purpose. But I understand from the municipality of Anchorage, we may not even qualify for any of that CDBG money, though we do the exact same thing we did in 1993. But I'd submit to you that that the public use that the municipality and the mayor. Mayor Fink said that existed in 1993, exists today, and that building's in better shape today than it was in 1993. It might not look it, but we're, you know, we're at the lower ring of, of money coming in, and uh, we can put up with that building. Uh, I think all the tenants would agree to that, and uh, thank you. But it would you. be helpful if we could get those documents from HUD on the restrictions. I've got the young lady in the back, then the young lady over here. So. I'm sorry, I didn't get the gentleman's name. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Lynn Kelly. Uh, Lynn Kelly. Yeah, uh, Thank President you. of Boulder Persons. Thank, Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sandra Cambry, I'm the Executive Director of Maple Peak Avenue mm -hmm. Senior Services. Um, something that I think was omitted, at least referring to our lease. Uh, we have in our lease what is, I think, still called a kickout. Which starting uh, January yes. first? Could you could you see the Could you come forward? Mr. Traney has a terrible hearing. I'm sorry, Mr. Traney. <laughs> That's all right. It's usually coming from administration. I have terrible. Hearing. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. Come come in. We. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank. You. Our lease, and I can't speak to the rest of them, but our lease that was effective January 1st, 2012, has that as of January 1st, 2013, either party may give the other 90 days notice and we have to leave. Or we can tell the municipality and we can break the lease. So the effect of that is that as of January 1st, 2013, if the building is sold and if the new owner doesn't want us, all they have to say is we're, we are exercising our 90-day, I'm not sure what the early termination, we call it a kick-out kick out clause, and we have to be gone. And I don't know, like I said, but some of the other tenants might have that same clause. That would then um, make the lease that while indeed is a year-long lease in all intents and purposes it's a 90-day lease and the other thing I had to say is um, Mr. Kelly I agree so far as I know the municipality has never come to us and said okay is there a way you can give us back some space so we can rent it and make more money 
there were ways to mitigate their losses. But so far as I know, I might have been on the, the um, maintenance side, and it certainly was on the rent side because they doubled and quadrupled rents. But nobody asked if there was any way to give back space so they could make more money. So there, there are things they could have done to mitigate their losses. Mr. Traney, then Ms. Gray Jackson. How many Anchorage citizens do you guys serve a month or a year? Uh, well, last year, if we're a small organization, so if you count every time we help somebody in, in our mission, over 19,000. I mean, that could be food boxes one day, a ride the next day, uh, a grant to get go to the dentist the third day, et cetera, et cetera. You take food boxes to seniors that are shut into their homes? We do. Uh, thanks well, to I have a mother that gets that home. every day down south, and she yeah. really appreciates when they come in to bring her food. She's, well, like, she's 86 now. She calls me young, and I have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Where I work, that's the only place, except now, thanks to Mr. Hall, that anybody else calls me young. Um, <laughs> My assistant today is 90, so I, I feel pretty young. But yeah, we take food boxes once a month to people. Salvation Army delivers meals, but we also tell people where they can go get that. But we also have a food shelf for people that come in. We have been known at the last minute to run dog food to somebody whose dog is out of food. Um, pet food, food, grants for emergencies, transportation, uh, we really do. And I'm sure all the rest of our tenants do, but we really, our clients are why, you know, the, the purpose of the building. And in fact, when Mayor Wirch was in office, um, that's why they wanted us out of that little house, ostensibly on Fifth Avenue. Ostensibly, it was going to be widened. Well, that never happened. But the real estate department said, you guys are a perfect fit for the purpose of the building, because all our clients are extremely low to low income. We have a few middle income folks, but we serve the lower income folks that mostly aren't served anyplace else, that really otherwise fall through the tough cracks. Um, we're one of those niche agencies that serve a very needy market. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Gray Jackson, then Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sandy, thank you very much, and everybody else for being here today. I really appreciate it. But thank you for mentioning the 90-day kick-out clause, because um, I wish Mr. McCannis was still here, because what I thought I heard him say was if there was a, a lease in place by, um, say, you know, if they closed in February and there was a lease in place already, that they would indeed have a whole nother year. And from what, that's what he said, and from what I'm hearing, he <coughs> said, that's not the case. Do you, do you respond? Oh, I'm sorry. Most recent places. What was your question? Stand up, Susan. I was looking. Okay. Yeah. Sandy just mentioned a 90-day kickout yeah, clause. I, just, I was looking okay. for it. But yeah. Mr. Vicalis said a little while ago, and I wish he was still here, that basically, and I asked the question, if they close on the building with the new buyer in February. If there were leases, one-year leases in place, they would essentially have a whole nother year when that isn't the case. So he may be misstated. I, I, I agree, yes, because it says oh. termination during the term of any options executed after the primary term of this lease. So that would be the following two. Right. Then except as otherwise provided in paragraph 14, which is default by the tenant for not paying, Either party may terminate this lease for any reason by getting 90 days notice. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad I, that I asked that question, Mr. Michaelis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Johnston. Um, as far as tenants for this building, is there a wait list? No. Not whether or not. Okay. And then, how do do tenants qualify to be? Or does the municipality have sort of a qualifying? Yeah, they have to submit. Uh, Form indicating that they are a nonprofit, but it's not a matter of service or, or they low income. Low income or I mean, I, I'm just yeah. I would have to go back and see what was requested uh, for them to submit to qualify as a nonprofit. Mr. 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 Drummond, uh, if 
If I might ask your indulgence, we're running short on time. I think it's really critical that we hear from these yes. folks while they're here. <coughs> so I'd, I'd like to accommodate them and then we'll get the questions in closing. This young lady here has been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. I'm all along for those who don't know me. I am. Have that, that would be very helpful. And we okay. And we do basically the same thing as Sandy, but we do it with a different clientele. We do it for all local income people. We allow all local income people, no matter who it is, street sleeping in the woods, whatever. We try and help them get out of that situation which is very hard to do within acreage now. The city went up because of all the trees where they could kind of shovel themselves. With no money in the way to go, no food. Most of the people right now that I'm dealing with, I'm back getting here, that they deal for that. Sleeping in their cars. OCS want to move in, take their children, but they're only giving them money for food to come out. Close our house. What are we going to do? I'm asking this city. That building that we have down there was built for the nonprofit. That's my understanding of the paperwork. But yet, it's tax zip. So why has it cost the city so much money? I'm not understanding. Help me. We can't help the people in the community, but you can take away. If you can take away the food, the clothing, finances, where they gonna go? This mayor is supposed to be running this city, which I don't see he's doing a good job, and that's my opinion. I am very disappointed that nobody has made this a historical mark. Is it because he don't want a black man's name up there? Or is it because he owns all the buildings around there? And what is he trying to build? What is he trying to put in his pocket? So we need to start looking at dumb corporations. And finding out how we got to this situation. The building was built in 1968. Now how we have this problem? And these people have nowhere to go. Nowhere to get in out of the car. Nowhere to get coffee. I wish we had to the kitchen in there. It's still across the street because it's a real small place. And we got a lot of homeless people. And they're increasing daily. We don't even get the subsidies that we do need and resources we do need to help take care of. If I see everybody else, they can find their office, they go home they have a decent meal. Their kids not sleeping outside. They got clothes and shoes. Why well, this, as they say, the Lord decides of what they need for these people. These people are not out here because they want to be. This is the city of Anchorage. There's enough people in this place to get help. Sandy take care of the seniors. Us take care. We got see, We got them all from seniors to baby. Now, this city is supposed to be helping the people get back on their feet, and, and we're not seeing it. We're not seeing the money coming into the community. We see it going up. Not coming in. So what is the city gonna do? We scuffling down there, we raise the rent, we barely make it in meat for them. As it is, you raising the rent for what purpose? The bear's pocket? Who's pocket? And when you do your research, you find 
more than you ever known with that. Ma'am, I need you to summarize. I've got three what more people What is waiting. this city going to do for these people? If you take that building from them, what are you going to do for these organizations? How are you going to help feed them? How are you going to help take care of them? And this is supposed to be a city. A municipality, and we ain't seen it because it's not coming back to the community. That's my stomach, which you're going to do. Yeah, that's it. I'm going to live. Thank you, Manish. My name is John Hamrath with uh, Intervention Helpline. And on attachment two, uh, final page, it lists uh, five tenants in that building. That's not the total amount of tenants that are in that building. That's who the municipality has leases for. On the second floor of that building where intervention helpline is listed, we also have the Alaska Kitty Patients Association. We have Gail Noska, and uh, uh, who does assessments for intervention helpline. And intervention helpline's um, basic mode and our challenge is to help the citizens in Anchorage who have alcohol and drug problems get into treatment. Uh, over the past three years, just briefly, uh, we facilitated 254 interventions. We don't turn anybody away for lack of funds. Most of the people that are in that area, the Brother Francis Shelter, the Beans Cafe, the Soup Kitchen, this caddy corner across the street, it's all in that area, the Red Roof Elmo. Uh, the, I don't know what it's called now, the Red Roof Inn, right down the street, but uh, also Health and Social Services, uh, Anchorage is right down the street. We're all right there. That's our clientele. That's the people that we help. And the, the problem that we have getting people into treatment here in Alaska is terrible. Most of the women, uh, I have to facilitate, get money to send them out of state because there's not facilities here to detox them. But that's just our mission. We also uh, took uh, 1,568 callers uh, and gave them options for treatment. How do you get into treatment? We get distraught families to call us, don't know what to do. What do we do with our 16-year-old son that's on drugs or spice? Where do we, where do we send him? And we help facilitate uh, places that they can go or give them help and answers. We also took 2,800 uh, phone calls from the community that just had questions of what do we do. And uh, just in a nutshell, um, that's where our clientele is, that's where we're located, and that's where we are able to, to help the people that, um, that actually call for help that we get from 211, South Central Foundation, uh, Providence Hospital. They call us because they don't know what to do. So thank you for your time. A, a question. You said there are other tenants that are not on attachment to, and right. they're all they're all paying rent. They are paying <coughs> rent. They are sharing the uh, second floor rent because we couldn't afford to pay it when they uh, so tripled so our rent. So they tripled our so rent so a so year so. ago, and at that time they told us that we could have that building for a year, they would write us a lease, which they hadn't done for four or five years because they said they were going to relocate us. Once uh, in the worst administration, uh, they had a place for us in Mountain View that apparently fell through. But in any event, w uh, we had a year lease and then uh, they gave us the option um, and we were under the impression we were going to have another year that this wasn't going to be a crisis again. Okay, I've got five minutes and three people, four people in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Hall. My name is Mike Bronson. I'm a constituent of Mr. Hall in West Anchorage. I'm also a member of the local National Association for the Advancement of Color People. So I'm making a few comments on our behalf. We're a tenant in the building. And just a small question, even though many others spoke pretty well. As, you, as the assembly looks at the formula that the staff has brought to help make a decision on, on the fate of the building, when you take a look at the, at the element of a potential cost savings of roughly $70,000 a year, that's the city's maintenance cost, we understand, minus the rent. I just suggest that think about comparing that savings that you may enjoy upon sale of the building. Compare that to the, uh, the potential the city may have to pick up uh, some of the tab or the services of many of the groups in the building now. So that's why I know that's hard to quantify. 
But as you're looking at the formula and weighing the costs and benefits for the municipality, think about your cost savings that are pretty well worked out by the staff. Compare that with the potentially much higher cost the city would have to bear if the nonprofits were to be, you know, basically negatively affected and have to reduce their services. So thank you very much. Ms. Jones. Thank you. I really hadn't intended to come and say anything. I was just going to sit and listen, but it's hard to do because I really do have a lot of history. I was there when Lydia Silcray wrote the grant. It was an EDA grant for the first two floors, and it was designed to be a community service building to serve the downtown area. And I've known all of these agencies that have been there, and there's no doubt doing a good job. But the painful issue is you can't get there unless you talk about this building being subsidized. You have to pay utilities. You have to pay. That's where the money does go. And you can't get there at 25 cents a square foot. And with the Community Development Block Grant, the pressures that would be there for homeless, the amount of money that's involved, those are the decisions that the assembly is going to have to make, and those are the issues that you know nonprofits have to face. And it's every nonprofit; it's not just this one. So there's going to have to be some compromise. Whether you sell it, you get the money back, but it really is a very expensive uh, building to operate. And I've met with all of these agencies at one time, and I now know. Owning a building, it's very difficult. Operations and maintenance and those costs continue to escalate. So I would encourage the assembly and the administration to continue talking and working with these nonprofits, but really on a very realistic basis. Because if you're only collecting 10,000 and the cost is 76, you've got a lot in between and it's gonna require a subsidy to get there. So. Thank you. Two gentlemen here, and then I want to have to wrap it up. I, I believe I have two. The gentleman next to you wanted to speak to? No. Oh, okay. My comments are a bit more broad stroke than the ones we've heard before. Uh, one factor is that the building has always been in service of the community. It was built in 1968. It was originally housed by the Red Cross. Okay, so even at that time, it was providing service to the community. Ever since that time, it was renovated, and the nonprofits uh, moved in and became more numerous. We've always been giving to the community. We've been working with other nonprofits. Uh, my name is Ellsworth James. I was NAACP president for two years. I now work with NSI uh, in various capacities. But not only do we have several groups that we deal with, we also are a hub for other nonprofits doing things for them that they would not be able to do by themselves. In addition to that, we have a synergy to every other nonprofit in the building. I'm in Sandy's office quite a lot. I'm on the third floor quite a lot. We're always trying to put things together. You know, people come in and they don't have something. We don't send them away. We make sure that we go through everybody in the building to see what we can do, and then we go outside. We have made midnight uh, treks out to places trying to help people get help, make sure that they are recognized, that their needs are being met or at least addressed. Alaska gets a lot of grant money for the, for the federal government. The reason that happens is, is because we have a state that's twice the size of Texas, but our population is so incredibly small, and our infrastructure still has a lot of growing to do. So it's nonprofits and agencies that fills that gap between what the state what the municipality and what the federal government are, are even able to do. And this building is the epitome of those things that happen. Now, we're talking about utilities. We, we know about snow removal, we know about heat, we know about the maintenance, but these are issues that have only recently become talked about. No one has ever talked to us about these things. If these are such an issue, why were they not talking to us about three or four years ago? Hey, we need to do something to, to address the, the, the maintenance. We need to do something to address these costs. This has just happened. We can't, re we can't react that fast. As nonprofits, our budgets have been cut and cut and cut again, and we're still there. 
it is the responsibility of the municipality to care for all citizens, those that can and those that can't and that those that are in the middle. We support all and we need that help. What better way for the municipality to do what's best for the community than to support an, a, a building that houses those that help? And, and, and that's really all I have to say. Mr. Honeman, very Just quick. real quick, by show of hand, please. For those, you see the paperwork, if you haven't seen it, the gap Mr. Jones is talking about. If there were a way to work creatively towards making a purchase of the building so that you're then responsible for your own building's maintenance on upgoing, ongoing up, upkeep and cost, show of hands, anybody interested in trying to work through a process we, of that? We don't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We can make that work. Okay. I mean, I, you, as you see the challenge, as Ms. Jones said, there are many nonprofits in the city. I'm sure that they would love to have similar help. We need to figure a way to be creative working together to make this happen. Could I just add one quick thing? That we cannot, as tenants of that building, maintain that building. The city will not let us. All right, I've got, I've got to close it, but I've got to close with a comment. Number one, I don't want you to leave here ever thinking that we don't think you have value. We absolutely know you have value. And I will tell you that sometimes we save money by spending money. The reason, and thank you, Ms. Gray Jackson, for requesting this work session, is this is the first time this first time we've seen it showed up on our agenda. So you're here because we care. And we appreciate what you do for this community. And you can probably be relatively well assured the conversation has just begun. So with that, I need to close this one. We've got someone waiting.